Well, why don't we uh, get get started today? Uh, welcome, everybody. It's always fun to see new faces. There's a few people I don't think I've seen before. So welcome to the Tower Center at SMU for today's program on selling ideas and buying influence, Mexican-American think tanks and the promotion of an immigration agreement. A nice, neutral, non-provocative title from <laughs> 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 our presenter today. It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Jesus Velasco. Tarleton State University, who also serves as a uh, fellow of the Tower Center and co-director of the new uh, Texas-Mexico program here within the Tower Center, which you'll be hearing a lot about uh, from uh, Dr. Velasco and from me. Uh, one thing I will mention, uh, in addition to the events that are listed here, we do have uh, two events on March 16th and March 17th dealing with Texas-Mexico relations mm -hmm. during an election season. Um, and immigration and other cross-border issues are particularly important this time around. So we're doing an event on the evening of March 16th at the Mexican Consulate, featuring Dr. Velasco, featuring our own Cal Gilson, uh, and two of the other leading uh, scholars of U.S. and Mexican politics, one from Columbia University, one from CIDE in Mexico City. The following day on, on March 17th, we will reconvene at Tarleton State. So for any, any uh, Stephenville folks in the room, um, there's uh, another event, same topic, but a little closer to home. So with that, I will turn the floor over to our guest today, Professor Velasco. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for my friends and colleagues that are always support me in these kind of events. And usually speakers always start saying, oh, thank you so much. This is so important for me. And sometimes they are, don't really mean that. Uh, <laughs> but in this case, I really mean that. Because what you're going to be listening is one chapter of a book that I'm writing. So for me to listen uh, your feedbacks and criticism and viewpoints is essential to improve. Scholars live uh, about listening from criticisms, and, and so this is this is important for me. I'm going to stand. If not, I can see my my slices. So, what you uh, what I'm writing? It's a book about the relationship between the Mexican government and American intellectuals in the 20th and 21st century. And the idea was basically started when uh, Salinas de Gortari, the president of Mexico, started negotiating NAFTA. And somebody asked him, well, but you are very pro-American. And he said, so what? And at that time, that was kind of a, a forbidden to do it. I mean, it was like almost like saying, oh, I'm pro-imperialism. And people <laughs> were very afraid to listen to that. So I decided to, to really trace the ideas of how the Mexican government interact, but not only from the Mexican viewpoint that, you know, like a, uh, uh, international relations, how the Mexicans interact with the United States, but also how the Americans interact with Mexico. So I call this kind of mutual history more than anything else. And, and you're going to listen about the last one, but I have a draft on this. I have a draft on this. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to write this one because it's extremely, it's very interesting, but it's extremely complicated for the uh, difficulties to obtain information. I have to go to the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign because there are several archives there of the Olympic Games uh, that were in Mexico, but I don't know, it has been very complicated. And I have already finished this one, and you're uh, going to listen to this. Uh, most political scientists never work in archives. Most of them. There are many that work in archives, but no, most of them never work in archives. Well, I don't mind. I enjoy working in archives. I have consulted 12 archives to do, to do this, uh, like eight or nine in the United States and the other in Mexico. So if you, if you t see now what's going on in the discipline of political science, history, or, or even American studies, everybody talks about transnational. It has become kind of the of the hot topic in 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 social sciences. So you have people in history that talk about transnational history, and you have a special issues from historical journals like um, Journal of American History that deals with this. Then you have American studies that also talk about um, 
about American studies, and the presidents of this organization give a speech about transnational. And then political scientists have work on this, especially during the 1970s and 80s, early 90s, and then it has diminished a little bit. But, but they continue working on this. So what, what do they have in common? Well, these uh, historians and people working in, in American studies, they have just a few notions like uh, culture doesn't know any borders. So you can interact with, with going beyond your national uh, borders. Second, uh, you have to look what's going on beyond those borders, but also to see what happened in your own entity. So it's a kind of dual interaction. And understand how the nation is seen beyond the borders. For instance, I'm working right now on a paper that, that for me it's a lot of fun, and this is not part of, of this research, that is to see how the world see American elections. Jesus, it's fascinating. Donald Trump <laughs> is a great subject for me. You know, so I like the guy, not because what he says, but because everybody's matching. So it, it's a lot of fun to perceive. And... Uh, uh, <coughs> I have to ask Carl, but uh, up to my recollection, I have never seen a paper of that sort. And um, if Carl doesn't know, nobody knows. Well, <laughs> then, <laughs> then there, are, there are things that are meaningful in both countries. For instance, immigration is a very important thing for Mexico and the United States. So this is what the people of, of history and, and American studies uh, consider. The political scientists came with an idea that I love it, and, and I love it because it really helps me. And it's the notion that you can have regular inter interactions between one state and a non-state actor of another place. So you can get a lot of knowledge. You know, it, um, realists were always saying that, that the international relations are between states and especially between, pe uh, between governments uh, for purpose of national security. That was like the main, main thing. But this guy said that there are many other actors and that, th that is important. So this idea helped us to, to take uh, a notion of what it is to have an open or a closed system. And in the United States, this is, this is very important because the United States is an open system. I mean, there are a bunch of people that interact with the United States. You can agree or disagree, but for instance, the, the book of Mayor Chimer and went on the Israeli lobby is one example of this, right? So Israel interacting with the American political system. Or the lobby, since they start as an institution in 1946, they do that. And there are many other participants in, in this labor organizations, Hispanic organizations, and many others. So, and this take non-state actors into account, like ideas, which is very complicated to deal with them, but, but they take this, this kind of things. And, and the important thing is how these people interact. What is the notion of how do you get together in this particular case, the Mexican government with American think tanks. What is, what is the relationship? And, um, and of course, you can integrate different levels of analysis, domestic and international, and you try to observe how this sort of coalition promote policy changes, in this particular case, the United States. Um, so. For this talk, of course, is not necessarily the main purpose of the general book. I just wrote this to give you some hints about what I'm trying to do. It, and basically, is the notion that Mexico, uh, uh, as a weak state, usually tries to influence American policies using two channels. One that is the traditional diplomatic channel between states and, and representative of each government. And the other is what people call public diplomacy. And public diplomacy is the notion that you can interact with different actors of the, of the American society in this particular case. And Mexico has to do that in order to try to defend itself as a weak state between a strong state and try to influence. 
this is very interesting for, for several reasons in the case of Mexico. In the case, let me go back. In the case of, well, this is complicated. In the case of Mexico, it's very important because since, 19, since 1914, Mexico came with the idea of what people call the Mexican principles of foreign policy. And those principles, one of the main is you do not interfere in the political affairs of other countries. And of course, Mexico was very afraid of that. Why? Because the United States has invaded Mexico three times. And in one of those invasions, the United States took like 50% of the Mexican territory. And if, you, if we were in, in 1840, we would be right now in Mexico. So the people were saying, uh, we have to stop this or do not interfere. But later on became part of the general principles that we do not deal with, with with the political system. We have to respect, and at that time, Mexico was trying to avoid that somebody else would interfere with, with Mexico, more than anything else. So, okay, then what happened? Well, we, we know more or less the story. I'm just gonna try to recapitulate for you. In, in, in the, year, the year 2000, Vicente Fox came to power in Mexico, and that was a huge accomplishment in, in Mexican history. For the first time in 71 years, a president from a different party that is not the PRI won the presidency. And that was very, very important. And, uh, and so Mexico, for the first time, was talking with the United States as an equal partner. They said, Mexico is a democracy, so we have to deal with the Mexican democracy. And this was called, this Mexican democracy was called by many people, especially in the government, the, pres uh, the democratic bonus. And the Mexican government decided to use that democratic bonus with the United States. It was and is the main partner of the relationship. And actually, it's not the United States, it's Texas. So uh, if the United States disappeared and only Texas become independent, we can, we can leave uh, dealing with Texas. So if you ask, talking about Mr. Trump, if you ask Trump to put the wall, well, see you later, guys. We're gonna have some problems here uh, in Texas. Mexico changed foreign policy from reactive to proactive. And this was very important because the Mexicans felt that they can play the policy of early birth so that they can come with ideas and promote and push the United States to do what they want because they were aware. And there was a team of people that, that, that really uh, felt compelled to, to really work and get closer with the United States. <coughs> Immigration was relevant for both, and we know that. It was relevant for, for, um, uh, for Fox and for Bush for different reasons. For Fox, Fox was a, was a governor of a state that sent immigrants to the United States. He grew up in Guanajuato, he was aware of that, and he didn't have to, to really have, have a particular knowledge in immigration. He left immigration, he felt immigration since the time that he was born. And when he was in, in power as, as a governor, he even got together with Bush to talk about immigration when President Bush was governor of Texas. So they were very aware, and they like each other, which is, which is a kind of weird thing if, if, if you believe that you know, interest is the most important thing, which I do believe. But, but you know, for instance, Jorge Castañeda, when he came here to give a talk, uh, and I talked to him, he said, really, he likes him. I mean, really, he likes him openly, he, he, he said that. So, and so Fox was for that reason, and, and Bush was very interested in immigration for many reasons. One, that I, well, not for, for a couple of good reasons. One is because for a long, long time, the Republican Party have tried to catch the Latino vote, vote. and they can't, because most of the Latino, with the, with the exception of the Cubans, vote for the Democratic Party. However, in some instances, they have been very successful catching the Latino vote. For instance, in 1984, Ronald Reagan won the Latino vote. In, 19, in 2004, 
George Bush won the Latino vote, and when he was governor of Texas in his sec in his reelection, he won the Latino vote here in Texas. So they knew that this was possible, and this is important for him, President Bush, and for the Republican Party. So the, and, 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 and there were many figures. There were almost twelve million dollars, six million uh, immigrants, sixty percent of them, sorry were Mexicans, uh, then the, 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 uh, the United States start, uh, start sorry, doing, doing something that really affects what the Mexicans perceive as the circulation. And the circulation was the idea that it was prevalent in the 1970s, 1980s, that you come, work in the United States, you get your own money, even as, as undocumented, and you go back to Mexico. Right now, with this idea of Operation uh, Gatekeeper and, and hold the line in Texas and uh, safeguard in Arizona, it was almost impossible to cross. Well, not. It was very difficult to cross the border. And the people that crossed the border decided not to go back because it was so complicated. There were thousands of people that died crossing the border, especially in Arizona. Because I always tell my students that if you go to Arizona during the summer, is the closest place to hell. I mean, you can <laughs> fry an egg right there. there there's no possible. I mean, they get 120, right? So it's 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 horrible. So imagine this guy that doesn't have any special um, training or equipment to cross the border in the desert of Arizona, Jesus Christ, they died. <laughs> so, <laughs> what you have here is the Mexican proposal. This was the proposal. Many of these ideas you have here all the time, but let me just, uh, you know, the legalization of the undocumented workers, uh, uh, um, guest workers program, in increase the number of visas, what, uh, work to, uh, to, to have a better situation on the border. And this was very important because it was not an American proposal. It was a Mexican proposal. And Mexico was highly concerned for securing the border. And just to give you one anecdote, when September 11 happened, uh, the same day, September 11, the Under Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Enrique Berruga, decided unilaterally to close the border. So it was not even asked, of course, the Americans didn't ask, but next say thank you so much for taking that, that, that measure. But Mexico decided unilaterally. So this was also a very important concern for, for Mexico. And this that never flew and will never fly, uh, the idea that you have promote the, um, the, gro the economic growth of the areas that send immigrants to the United States. This was called in a, in a lecture that Jorge Castañeda gave in Los Angeles to a labor union, the whole enchilada. And the whole enchilada was very popular. The Americans hate, but the Mexicans love it. And, and the idea was very interesting because when you talk with these people, they said there were a bunch of interest groups dealing with immigration. And therefore, if we marginalize one of them, they're going to start fighting against each other. And we are not going to be able to capture the support of this. So we have to present a comprehensive immigration proposal. Because if not, we're going to, we're going to start a fight, a domestic fight among the different groups relevant for immigration. So <coughs> Mexico starts, and one of my, the theses of my book is that the idea to influence in the United States is not modern. It goes back to the 1920s, even the, the, early, the late 1910s. And it's, Mexico has done this many times, and I will show you at the end, many times, but there are moments in which they don't do it. For instance, now, where is the Mexican foreign policy to the United States? None. Why? Because people believe, and it's a debate, especially the people of the PRI, that we should not, they continue with the old tradition that we should not interfere in the domestic affairs of the, of the United States. So they conduct diplomatic relations, uh, public diplomacy, and they, they have a very strong campaign in the media. So what has been, uh, what was done by the Fox administration? 
and weeks has been done by any one of the cases that I study since the 1920s to the present time. First, they hire a lobby. Of course, the lobby didn't exist in the epoch of Alvaro Obregón in the 1920s, but they, have, they, they do the equivalent of having a, they have an agency. Then, they rely on the Hispanics, which has been a tragedy for the Mexicans, because Mexicans do not understand Hispanics. So, the Mexican government, the first contact with the Mexican government with the Hispanics was with Ricardo Montalban. Why? Because Ricardo Montalban was an actor, mm-hmm. and he knew Hollywood. So the Mexicans said he would be able to help us, you know, doing some uh, inroads here in the United States. Ricardo Montalban didn't have a clue about anything, just acting. So, <laughs> yeah, but but this was the first approach, and we can talk about why the Mexicans always fail with the with the uh, with the um, with the Hispanics. And in the lecture that Josh mentioned on the 16th is going to come over Rudy de la Garza, which is called the Dean of, of Hispanic Studies in the United States. And, and, and he even has proposals that everybody ignored, but I think that were very good. They transformed the Mexican consulates in a very active uh, uh, institution. Uh, why? Because the Mexican consulate for a long time were placed as the secondary branch of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. It was more distinguished to be an ambassador than to be a consul. Right now, the consulates are very active. And, and if not just as uh, the Dower Center, how active is the Mexican consulate? Jesus, they do a bunch of different things. And, and then they use intellectuals, think tanks, uh, and, uh, as a vehicle of communication of uh, Mexican views on immigration. That's basically my talk. How this happened? Well, Mexican religion, it was a binational tax task force. And the binational tax force was promoted, first of all, and by Andres Rosenthal. And Andres Rosenthal is the brother of Jorge Castañeda. He's a half brother, but they, they are more close than regular brothers. So, and Andres Rosenthal, before Fox uh, win the election, was promoting this idea. Um, the tax force published a paper highlighting the main proposal of the Mexican government that later on the Mexican government adopted as the whole enchilada. So the whole enchilada was published by, by this ta- uh, task force, not by anybody else. And they met with Fox and, uh, uh, and, and met with congressional staffers and and even before as Mr. President Bush assumed power, uh, Jorge Castañeda met with Condi Rice and with Colin Powell, and with George Schultz. Um, in private meetings, in, if you read his memories, he talks how he uh, got in the same plane of Condi Rice that was moving from Los Angeles to Washington, and Castañeda as the person placed me in the seat close to Condi Rice. So he, he had like, it's like three hours, four hours, right, flat? Just talking, talking with Condi. And, uh, and saying a memorandum of understanding. This was the people that direct the, 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 uh, the task force. <coughs> Ambassador Rosenthal, that is not only the brother of Castaneda, is one of the very, very distinguished Mexican diplomat. In Mexico, they are a group of very distinguished diplomats. And uh, uh, Rosenthal is one of them. He was Deputy Secretary of Foreign Affairs during, um, during Salinas and was Mexican ambassador in London and in, in, in Sweden, if I don't remember wrong. And then there were a group of people that was Dimitri Papadrimitrus, uh, that is a guy from, from Greece and was the teacher of Jorge Castañeda in Princeton. And Rafael Fernandez de Castro, that many, perhaps if you work in Mexico, have heard about this guy. He's very active, he's a, a scholar, but is also a very good promoter of different things. And he was the advisor of President Calderon in Foreign Affairs. So, why think tanks? Well, we know all that, because think tanks promote ideas. Think tanks are creators of ideas, too. So, they, they the media call them and they tell, you know, good um, 
abuse them, maybe I reproduce them, they have contacts with the Washington community, they do a lot of work to, to um, propose people that go to hearings and present their views in hearings, uh, and, and things of that sort. They talk a lot about, with, talk with many congressmen and also with the staffers. And, and once uh, I read, many years ago, that a congressman in the United States reads an average of 11 minutes a day, no more than that. I don't know if it's still very accurate or not, and, uh, but reads 11 minutes a day. So when you, uh, and that's basically your, your activities during the day, uh, the main two or three newspapers, just the headlines of the Washington Post, the New York Times, and sometimes the Wall Street Journal, and then you read uh, your local paper. And that's it. Just the headlines. It's 11 minutes. So they really care about what the staffers uh, tell them. So the Immigration Policy Institute became the main advocate of Mexican views. So the guys that create this, actually, they start working when Dimitri Papadimitrius was heading in, in, in the Carney Endow Endowment uh, for Peace, a program of immigration. And Jorge Castañeda, and, and, and another distinguished politician and a scholar, uh, Aguilar Sin served the class away like four or five years ago, no more, about eight years ago, um, were visiting fellows uh, for, in, in the 1990s. So these think tanks did something that the Mexico really want. And first, Dimitri Papadimitrius said, in an interview with me, that the main goal of his think tank is to infect the language. And by that they mean that you have to promote certain ideas that, or certain headlines that everybody gonna reproduce. It's like having a song in your mind that you are repeating all the time. So that's the goal of, of the think tanks. So they persuade influential people to adopt the ideas that they create in the task force and spend time with Congress. The Mexican government has a good knowledge of the American political system. For many people in Latin America, the best country that is able to interact with the United States is Mexico. It's not nor Chile, nor Brazil, it's just Mexico. However, you get to a certain level, level, sorry, and the sophistication is not very strong, right? So they, they lean on think tanks to, to receive some advice. So the peculiarities of the political system is always a permanent thing that, that, that they search uh, in, in American organizations. And during this time, they advised all the time that Mexico was over-concentrating in just one issue. And that was very important. Because this over-concentration produces something very negative for, for them. For, for accor according to this think tank for the Mexican government. They do not have to put all the eggs in just one basket. They thought that this visibility was counterproductive. That could be debatable. I don't think that is counterproductive, but uh, but many people believe that it is. And if you talk with President Bush, he <coughs> said that part of the problem was the visibility of the Mexican government. Uh, then also, they have training seminars for the Mexican officials, so about immigration laws, about how they were moved in, in Congress about what were the local laws of immigration in different states, how they change. In, in Mexico, every uh, January, there is uh, the consulates and the uh, ambassadors get together in Mexico City and spend two or three days uh, talking about different issues. Of course, the United States is always the, the number one issue. And they address in 2004 the Mexican, the Mexican officials to, to talk about immigration. And for Mexico, something that they really want was time. When is the right time to present some ideas? Do we do it today? Do we do it in two months? Do we wait for certain particular 
conjuncture, or, or why do we do that? And supposedly, think tanks present that. Um, this is a quote that you can read better than myself because of my tropical accent uh, <laughs> of Jerónimo Gutiérrez. And Jerónimo Gutiérrez was the Deputy Secretary of Foreign Affairs after the, the Castañeda and his team leave in 2003. So Jerónimo replaced uh, Enrique Berruga and became the Deputy Secretary of, of Foreign Affairs for, for North America, which is the United States and Canada. And, and as you might see, they were highly um, in contact with MPI and with intellectuals. And what I think that is extremely important for Mexico, and, and, and this is important in many other activities that we do on a regular basis, was legitimization. When somebody that is considered as a specialist endorses your views, you get more legitimate. So many people, uh, for instance, if you have a good recommendation letter and you are searching for a job and the recommendation letter is from a very distinguished scholar, they're going to look of, of your recommendation letter. If it comes from Professor Velasco, they are not going to look at it. So this is, this is very, very important. Legitimization that they provide, and, and, and they did it. So, why this fails? Well, this fails for many, many reasons. The first one, the, the scholars in Mexico and the United States have said that uh, this uh, proposal failed because of September 11th. I don't buy that. I think that that's, that's mistaken. The reason that they failed is that there were strong disagreements between both political parties inside each one of the Republican and Democrats, and strong fights among different interest groups that were uh, that were uh, relevant for immigration. So, if you see, see for instance, the Latinos, the Latinos do not want a temporary worker program. Why they want to have more Latinos here? So they want to have um, legalization. Then the church, not only the Catholic church, but also the Protestant church, that were. Uh, united in this task, of course not all the Protestant churches, there's a variety of them, um, they say yes for workers' program and for the legalization. Then the business groups, the business groups depending on what kind of business group. If you're a business group like uh, Microsoft, you want just more visas uh, for a short period of time. Because what you want to do is to bring the Chinese or the Indians or the Japanese or whatever, train them for three, six months, and then send them back to their own country. If you are in service or and some kind of service and agriculture, you want a permanent people here because you don't want to train them uh, all the time and replace them for new, for new workers. So this was a strong division. Then the labor, the labor also wants just um, wants only the uh, legalization, and then the conservative ideologues, they didn't want anything. And you can see that from, it's almost a consensus issue, almost. Marco Rubio got a little bit uh, different thing, but all of them are opposed to, to, uh, to immigration. So this is one uh, thing. Uh, September 11, of course, uh, relegate the topic to a second place. And immigration becomes relevant only in the sense that you have to protect the border. Because the Americans did not want to have somebody cross, crossing the border from Mexico to have a terrorist attack in the United States. Um, there were many people that said that, you know, a bunch of, of people will cross the border because it's very easy to cross the border and blah, blah, blah. But they almost tend to forget is that the people that um, that made the attack on September 11, all of them crossed legally from Canada. So uh, this is, and then um, security became the main issue. But if you trace, and I trace this on, on detail in, in my chapter, there were people like Condi Rice and Colin Paul, and, and even the same, the same uh, President Reagan that said, uh, this is this is not going to fly easily. 
So we went from the whole enchilada to a bimbo reef. <laughs> we didn't get more than that. You know, we promote everything and we just got a bimbo reef. And, and what we have here, it's uh, as a concluding remarks because I'm more interested in your comments. What we have here is in many ways something interesting for me. That is that these think tanks were the eyes through which the American society learned about Mexico. So they are the educators of the Americans and of the Mexicans in, to some extent about the United States and about Mexico. In Mexico, about the United States. In the United States, about Mexico. They form a transnational coalition which is very interesting. They, they, they get together and really promote something that is relevant according to them for both states. If you see the theory of transnational relations, these people did several things that could be pinpointed in the theory of transnational relations. For instance, they have high coordination between the Mexican government and an American think tank. They get together. You, just remember the, uh, the citation of, of Geronimo Gutierrez. In many ways, they work as a sub-governmental entity of Mexico in the United States. They did a bunch of different things for Mexico. They provide some access to American circles of power that, of course, the Mexican government has, but not always. So it's a way to go from the back door to those circles of power. And of course, these guys were very fortunate because they obtained high uh, privilege information that they can use in the United States. Let me give you just one example. In the, 19, uh, in the late 1980s, uh, early 1990s, when Mexico was negotiating with NAFTA, um, there was a, a scholar of CSIS, uh, Dalal Burr, that, that went to Mexico and she said all the time, oh, I got together with the president. I got together with the Secretary of, uh, of Foreign Affairs or, or, or with the Secretary of, of Politics in Mexico. And, you know, they told me this, this, and that. And then she came over here for a congressional study group. And she charged a bunch of dollars. Uh, believe me, they charge for a lecture between fifteen and $20,000 for a lecture. And, uh, and, and so... Everybody said, well, but she has privileged information. She got together with the president. She got together with, the, with, with these people. So they sell that information for their benefits. And, and, and what is very interesting for me is also that the, these think tanks in Mexico are the vehicle in which they connect ideas, communities, and interests between these two. And finally, they are the, an entity that it, and, the, and, the, and a Mexican proposal that is not national. The Mexican proposal was not defending the interest only of Mexico. It was a transnational proposal. It was created by entities in the United States and in Mexico that they have some common ground and they decided to present as a unique so, do we have uh, this uh, MPI as an institution that lost autonomy? Well, at first glance, no. Why? Because they were defending what they wrote. They were part of the people that made that proposal. What about all the activities that they did in favor of Mexico? Is this because they were the sub-government of Mexico or not? So I think that, if, just to finish, that the theory of, of international relations, it's good for this, but they have to specify the nature of the alliance. It's not, an, it's not the same to have an alliance with Amnesty International or any NGO than with a think tank. And they have to specify the power relation between the parts. Is this... Uh, Strong with the strong. I mean, it's, it's a very strong organization like Amnesty International 
with a very strong state? Is it strong and weak? Or is um, weak and strong? And that will help us to understand what is the nature. Just let me, let me go to this to give you a, a summary of what I have done so you have a you know, picture. If you see what happened, uh, what were the common strategies, a coalition with interest groups, in the Obregón administration were with the labor movement and intellectuals. The Mexicans were the revolutionaries that created the first revolution of the 20th century. So they thought, and they got together. At the beginning, they were trying to get together with the industrial workers of the war, and they ended up with the AFL. In the Salinas administration, were with think tanks and with business organizations. And in the Fox, again, with the Hispanic or organizations, the, the labor organizations and think tanks. In the relation with the Hispanics, all of them promoting one or another way relation with the Hispanics. The Mexicans believe that the Hispanics are like the Cubans or the Israelis, and they are not. So they promote a lobby in one or another way. Of course, here was, was an agency of the Mexican government called the Financial Agency of the Mexican government that was located in New York that behaved more or less as the lobby. In the time of Salinas de Gortari, the Mexican government paid $40 million for their lobby here in, in, in Washington that at that time was the, um, the most expensive lobby ever hired by a foreign government. And lobby to conduct public relations in, in Fox. Mexican consulates at the same time and intellectuals in the 1920s, you have more intellectuals. People that were sympathetic to the Mexican Revolution, that fair, felt highly identified with Mexico. People are, uh, uh, and you, you know some of this, like Ernest Greeny, that became very famous in American, in American politics after he wrote his book on Mexico. He was the managing editor of, of the nation. Or Carton Bills, or Frank Tannenbaum, or Robert Habermas, and many of other people. Uh, it's curious, but the Mexican Communist Party was uh, created by, by, uh, by an American intellectual. Uh, in the Salinas, of course, they did it, and with with uh, with Fox, they also did it. So what you have is is just a permanent um, effort of Mexico since the 1920s to the present time sorry, to interact with the American political system. Well, thank you, and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll keep the queue uh, up here, so if you want to ask a question, please just raise your hand and I'll write your name down. But I will take the prerogative and ask a question about the whole enchilada. <laughs> I'm really interested in this part of your talk, not only because your slides make me hungry, but because it, does, it raises a question. In, in, in bargaining theory, there's two ways to go about it, two general ways. One is, is the whole enchilada approach. You ask big, and you hope that you get some portion of the big ask. Right? And the, the other, the other um, essential theory is, is another food metaphor, the salami slice method. You don't ask for the whole salami, you just take up a little bit. Right? Nobody really notices, it's not the big deal. And suddenly the salami's gone, because we've eaten the whole thing. Right? I wonder if the story of why this effort failed is they went for the whole enchilada. Right? Rather than trying to move on issues which were prevent perhaps a little less provocative and less likely to stimulate American opposition okay, by going for everything, by going for a, a path to citizenship, which everybody called amnesty, mm -hmm. <laughs> and a guest worker program, and this and that and the other, um, you rose red flags against people who had a, a very strong incentive to fight back. So is the real story here the failure of using um, a think tank in this way uh, or is this just a story of the wrong approach towards getting your neighbor to do what you want? I think that's that's a very good and interesting question. And uh, just as a footnote, if you like enchiladas, mine are the best. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what time? <laughs> and I think that if you talk with the Mexican officials that were negotiating this, they honestly believe two things 
that of course did not work. One is the politics of the early bird. That you can approach the United States and say, you have to do that, and, and the Americans are going to go, uh, well, 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 and then they do it. I think that's absolutely silly. Because if you see how the American political system behaves, you have a president that is very active, but a Congress that is deliberative, the, the that takes a lot of time to decide something. But the Mexican government went with the idea that is basically to, to ask for the big pie. The idea that if you ask for the big pie, and they are fully aware, you will get something. Something, not everything, but something. But at least you are not going to put in jeopardy or in, in a struggle, in conflict, the different interest groups that are involved. So if you go and say, I'm going only for, for uh, let's say, uh, guest workers program. Yes, you're going to please a lot of people that work in, in, in agriculture, for instance. Business that are in agriculture, any kind of forms of agriculture. You're going to be making very upset the labor movement, very upset the Latinos. Just, just to give you one example. If you go the other way around, if you go just for amnesty, yeah, you might have some kind of support, perhaps a little bit better than the support that you have with, with um, Workers' Program, a little bit more support. But, uh, but at the end of the day, what you're going to have is two things. One, there are business groups that are very powerful that are going to be very upset because they want circulation more than amnesty. Some parts of the business group. And there are other people that are going to say, no, no, I want temporary people here. Why? Because they reduce their, 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 their salaries. So they have a guy that comes and depending on the time, uh, could charge you less than what you usually pay to these people. A friend of mine that is perhaps the most distinguished scholar in Mexico and one of the most distinguished in the United States on immigration told me that about five years ago, only two people, two people, or two organizations, were sued for hiring immigrants in the United States in one year. Two. So what happened? Everybody's happy with the status quo. Everybody. So of course there is the rhetoric that we're going to build a wall and go 10 feet high and blah, blah, blah. OK, you do it. First of all, you're going to create a horrible situation. And then Texas, going down. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but it, that's not part of the answer. So I think that they choose to go for the big enchilada, knowing that they will get less. And what they will tell you is, we were aware of, of the uh, salami metaphor, but um, we were trying to get at least something that was relevant for Mexico. Uh, and that's what they bet. When you use the term legalization or amnesty, are you referring solely to citizenship, or are you also including with that uh, some type of resident alien status that acquire, that it, uh, gives legality uh, maybe even an unlimited term. Well, uh, TPS, for example. Sorry? TPS, temporarily protected status? Yeah. Well, depending on how do you uh, ended up uh, negotiating this, because, for instance, up to my knowledge, and that's my case, um, you cannot be an American citizen uh, immediately. What you have to do is you get your legal resident. I'm a legal resident of the United States. I have a green card. I can work in any place that I want. But if I want to be an American citizen, I have to wait five years. Mm -hmm. so Unless you get married. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or you have a boy or a girl, uh, uh, which is right now controversial. <laughs> but, but yeah, if you have a baby. But, but it's not that you automatically get, but you have the permit to work. I think that the Mexican government were looking for that. But at the end of the day, when I... I use indistinctly. I know that there are some ideological connotations on this, but uh, I use for the presentation uh, in, in any way. But 
the Mexicans never ended up negotiating what kind of status. There are different kinds of status. Mm -hmm. But they were trying to make the people, the, 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 60 percent of the 12 million people that were living in the shadows here to have the possibility to work legally. If you see what is going on right now, the Mexican government is promoting the idea to make citizenships for those people. So, so the new trend is to make them American, no Mexicans. And, and this is the new trend. We can talk about the possible explanation. Um, could you? Oh, sorry, I was going to go down the line, Eileen. Oh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I guess I wanted to hear more about the role of the think tanks as organizations, because I think the, from what I hear you say, it seems to be very one directional. As you know, they're basically just doing Mexico's work. Um, and I guess I wanted to do, to hear more about how you think you know the organization's own interests and ambitions and norms and values played a played a role in it. Because from from at least from what I heard here, it seems it's sort of very passive. The organizations are passive and they're not sort of shaping or um, they're not acting in sort of a self interested rational way. Oh no, I think I think that uh, I'm sorry if I project that image. Uh, but let me tell you something. When, when Mexico negotiated the, uh, the free trade agreement, Mexico got together with four main think tanks. That was uh, Hudson Institute, the Institute for International Economics, the Brookings Institution, and the Heritage Foundation. Mm -hmm. In 1986, there was a big manifestation in Mexico that ended up in the Zócalo because Jesse Helms made the, uh, the Jesse Helms uh, uh, hearings in Mexico. And I was, you know, I'm old enough to be in that one, and I was in the rally, and one of the, of the expression was, kill the Heritage Foundation, die the Heritage Foundation, right? And then four years later, they were the main allies. <laughs> I always told, because I was, when I was conducting my interviews for, for that chapter, uh, it was in the 1990s, and, uh, and the Mexican officials uh, uh, told me, well, what do you think about this? I think, I said, I think that you are very silly. And I said, why? Because the Heritage Foundation will promote exactly what you are promoting without paying them anything. They have their own interests in exactly the same ideas of free trade. So they some of them of the think tanks are highly ideological like the heritage foundation or the cato institute that is libertarian some of them are highly academic or tend to be very academic i mean we as scholars have used here or there books by 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 the brookings institution i mean it, the, you have very good people right there uh, so uh, but they have their own interests and some of those interests sometimes coincide with Mexico. And Mexico, it's very pragmatic. They use this to promote their own interests. Or sometimes they try to seduce these, pe these people. Actually, my book, the title is Seducing America. <laughs> because, because they try to seduce these people, to say, look, this is pretty good. You will do it. And the Mexicans are good with that. Believe me. <laughs> you know. I cannot say the people, but in the negotiation of NAFTA, because this is a privileged information, have you seen those briefcases, like the doctor's briefcase, that are big, right? Where there were people that went and said, okay, guy, what about if I give you this briefcase to, to promote uh, NAFTA to scholars? Or they have another tool that never fails for the Mexicans. They have the Mexican señoritas. <laughs> so they, they, they put you with girls. And many people fall. Not all of them. They are very decent people, but there many people fall. So they do this kind of convincing seduction to to do things for Mexico. Do you think that this is a strange? No, many people do it here in the United States. Many people. It's not a strange. They do the same. So sometimes coincide, sometimes do not coincide the interests of these people. What they are and you know, there was a debate in Mexico in the 1990s in which they said, this is silly because you are going to only be influential in the Beltway. 
However, if you ask at that time, Jim Kilpatrick, or Colin Powell, or one of these big figures that were kind of, you know, in think tanks and, 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 and then in politics, to make a statement, that will be uh, done. And they legitimized something. Just to give you another example, the Mexican government, if I'm not mistaken, during the Calderon administration, paid one million and two hundred thousand dollars to President Clinton to go and legitimize the uh, the war on drugs of the Mexican government. He went, gave two speeches, talked with people, and he made a, one of the big speeches saying, "Oh, Mexico is doing a fantastic job." That means legitimization from an American standpoint from a guy that is very influential and highly recognized in the United States. And, and, and this was open. I mean, I, I didn't get it from any politician. The, the newspaper, the official newspaper, and the critical newspaper published that. That's what he, he charges. So there are cases that yes, and there are cases that no. <laughs> Answer in the purple shirt. Reverse. Um, <laughs> so, the idea of uh, utilizing think tanks as vehicles for um, negotiations is very interesting. But, um, I wanted to ask for your opinion on. Okay. It, it is no secret that certain, uh, say, big time companies and big time corporations in the United States have a big say on the types of policies that both Democrats and Republicans pursue or put out there for, uh, for the electorate. So what I want to ask you is, which one do you think will be more efficient uh, so that both sides can, um, uh, I guess, benefit from an agreement pursuing uh, those interest groups that are more or less, uh, I guess, pursuing the economic growth of America or going for the intellectual side of it, or should there be a mixture of both? Or That's an interesting question, but let me first highlight that I never said that they are vehicles for negotiation. They are not. Uh, what is important of think tanks is as Papa Dimitrius said, to infect the language. Because when you promote certain idea and people start talking about this, right, then you promote certain sensibility to that particular idea. Look, you can criticize if it's, or you can say if it's right or wrong. But Trump is saying all the time that he came with the idea of immigration in the current campaign and that he was the first one to promote to build a wall. Many of the candidates support to build a wall now. Is that it? Let's assume that, that everything is right, which is controversial, by the way, uh, because there are many organizations that ask for to build a wall even before, and we have parts of the, of the, of the border that we have wall. So it, this is very controversial. And what people do not understand, just as a footnote, is that the Mexicans will come even if you feel real a wall. And believe me, the Mexicans are going to be the next winner of polling in the Olympic Games. <laughs> so they're going to jump. <laughs> Boom! There. They're going to be the best. <laughs> and you can do it this. Have you ever seen those, those uh, in, in YouTube uh, clips in which they put a ramp? <laughs> I mean, it, it's true. I'm not. I'm, I'm not uh, uh, joking. They put a ramp. They have one of those huge truck, trucks that the Texans love, uh, and, uh, and they, they put a bunch of guys right there in, in those huge trucks, and they, boom, and they ended up in the American part. We are very good using the drug trafficking tunnels. <laughs> Look, Chapo has escaped three times with tunnels. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy. So I never said that they will <coughs> negotiate, but they want that their ideas are promoted, that people hear your voice, that you make a comprehensive notion that could be sell to the American audience 
that that you have a person that said, "Look, this is a fantastic idea." You know, so everybody wants to be part of this. They are in the business of seduction, in the business of impregnating the uh, the the market. They, they are people that work in marketing, marketing of ideas. Yeah, please. Can you explain to us the difference in the different states like Texas, Arizona, and California, their attitudes toward immigration, and how the Mexican think tanks have kind of adapted to those different attitudes? Well, they are, they are very different. Um, if you see the scale of how conservative is Texas, many people believe that it's one of the most conservative states, but it's not. And Carl might know much, much better than myself on this. Uh, Texas, uh, they have been, uh, people have done studies about who, could, who is the most conservative state in the, in the United States, people of rice. And Texas is a little bit above of the middle. A little bit above, so we are like the 27th. Just, I don't remember the, the numbers. So we are not the most conservative one, by the way. Second, we have had very conservative people that deploy the um, the National Guards to the border, as did the Californians, uh, and many things of that sort. And we have a very conservative uh, uh, governor now. But the one before was also conservative. <coughs> but the Mexicans were concerned with states like Alabama that were presenting kind of races in their new position. And they were very concerned with that. And they decided to fight in the courts, this kind of, of, of situation. So, and they promote the fight. I mean, they were not uh, 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 passive in their promotion of the fighting. So you have states that are more conservative than Texas. That doesn't mean that, that we are you know, open to immigration. It, if you go and see the polls conducted by by the by UT Austin, they have a they have a, a group of people that make polls for 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 Texas. One of the main concerns of the Texans is always immigration, always immigration. It's a number one, number two most of the time. But the other states were more against immigrants were more tough. They passed laws that, that, that were fought, and, and many of them were um, uh, 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 fail at the end of the day. OK, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was great. Um, my question is, like, what did the Mexican government um, got from all this uh, work with the think tanks? And uh, well, obviously not legalization, but from the whole enchilada, what did they get, and if it was worth it? Uh, if not, like, what did they expect to get? You already said they didn't expect the whole enchilada, but what did they were looking for? <coughs> well, I think that they expect to get at least one of the main two, either legalization or guest workers program. What they got was basically an increase in the number of visas. So we, the, the United States have a kind of quota. Um, I remember that when I got my green card, the person that deals with this in the university told me, you are lucky because with Mexicans we have a, a good number of visas. I don't remember what is the number of visas, but let's say five, 500 per year or whatever. But there are other places that we have very little. So when you come from an African state, right? So we have a lot of problems to get the visa. So you are lucky. The Mexicans were able to increase the number of visas during the whole period of Fox and Bush. And they were looking for either one of these two. But the main idea of Mexico during Fox and in many other places uh, in the history of Mexico, like Obregón or Salinas, is that you have to play the game. It's like somebody tells you, uh, you know, we're going to play uh, uh, football with Tony Romo, 
right here in, in the in, in the Cowboy Stadium. It's just gonna be about among friends. And after that, we're gonna have the best barbecue in the world. And you go and say, okay, I'm gonna go, but I'm gonna play with my soccer ball, <laughs> right? No, you were not invited for that, first of all. And second, it's a great event. You cannot miss it. So you have to play American politics like an American. If you do that, it's very difficult to, to make a percentage, but your possibilities increase that you're going to be successful. There are many cases in which the possibilities uh, do not turn uh, in, in, good, in good way. I mean, that you basically fail. But there are many other cases that you are successful. Can you avoid to play the game? Yes. Peña Nieto is avoiding to play the game. He doesn't play the game. Is that okay? In my view, no. No, the American political system is very open. They promote that you play the game. They invite you to have a very nice cup of French wine. And you say, nah, I want my water. You are making a big mistake. That's, that's my personal viewpoint. And, um, and you have to play sophisticated, which is not easy. It's not easy to play sophisticated in the United States. But there are the means to do it, especially if you have one element and just one element. Money. Okay. All right. so, yeah, thank you. Um, Professor Polesco, could you put the last slide back up? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to go down to the bottom right-hand corner. Okay, this one? Uh, vehicles of communication. And I want to talk about what you mentioned about kind of situating ideas to the system. <clears throat> if you think about political change in terms of the ability to change a prevailing narrative. <clears throat> and I think in terms of Trump, who talked <coughs> initially about Mexico, and I was listening, I heard this first comments, I was horrified, but his voter increase went up, and he's been very, very, very successful about changing the narrative. <coughs> when you think about some of the stronger think tanks at work, along the line between Mexico and the U.S., are you seeing a major shift in the narrative that's approaching, that's beginning to permeate through those think tanks? What is the dominant story that's taking hold? Do you mean American think tanks? Well, I think <coughs> that, you know, we have more than 2,000 think tanks in the United States. But possibly only four or five that are so influential that they would be? Depending on, on one topic. You can have a think tank like MPI. They don't do anything else but immigration. If you really want to have a specialized think tank on immigration, you better go to MPI. Of course, there are others that specialize on immigration. Yes. Yes, there are others, and they are one very conservative, the Immigration Forum, that is very conservative. They, wa they don't want anything. They want to... to deport all the immigrants, close the border, we don't want to be uh, dealing with these people. So it depends, but what you have, I think, today is that there's a group of people, people call, if, if, if you, I'm, I'm going to make perhaps a, a big mistake, but if, if you see that the different, the different members of the Republican Party, you see that you have the evangelicals, and uh, that many of them are blue-collar workers, and, and they are a very to idea to close the, 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 the border. If you see another part of the Republicans that are blue collar workers, but they are not evangelicals, they, um, they are, want to close the border. If you go to the establishment, they want to have some kind of negotiations uh, that, that will be tough, but not to the level of this one. If you go to the neoconservatives that are the other branch or the other group within, they hate Trump. I mean, they basically hate. Uh, William Crystal said that if Trump is nominated as the candidate of the Republican Party, he will vote for a third candidate. These are the guys that support <coughs> since the beginning um, the invasion of Iraq. And actually, I wrote a book about that. 
and actually they were the guys that since the first I invasion of Iraq with the with Bush father mm -hmm. were saying Bush made a huge mistake and the huge mistake is that they he didn't went uh, he didn't go sorry to to Baghdad and right now people are saying Bush father was very smart so you have different group of people of course they are the ones that the one negotiations like 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 this uh, MPI and people that don't want anything like the immigration forum so you have different perspectives what I think is dominating in general terms in general terms is the idea the right now that we have to, to be tough at the border if it's a wall or not, if it's uh, cameras on the wall, if there's more patrols on the wall, that's um, debatable. But you have to also understand that this is a campaign. This is my view. This is a campaign. And in campaign, you say a bunch of different things. You know, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And, 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 and you make all kinds of promises. You know, the United States is going to Mars, and we're going to start living right there in five years because they have a beautiful swimming pool. <laughs> There's no truth. This is a campaign, and you promise a bunch of different things. What you will be able to do, imagine a President Trump. President Trump, and imagine, which is not going to be the case, but imagine, we are in the imagine part, uh, Democratic uh, Congress. It's not going to be the case. But imagine that. Jesus Christ, American institutions work. I mean, they work. And, and, and you're going to have what the Republicans are doing now with Obama. We do not pass anything. And I always believe that the profession of politician is a profession. Once I remember that a friend of mine told me, well, you know a lot about the United States. What happened if they, if they name you the Mexican ambassador in Washington? I said, Iran? I don't have any clue about how do you deal with these <laughs> problems. Zero. <laughs> right? So there are professions in which you specialize in things. I can be a consultant. Yeah, I can do that. I can give you some ideas of how I perceive things. But be a politician is a profession. It's not, you know, that any, anybody can do it. So you have these two different or, or many different kinds of views and think tanks. That, But in general terms, all of them want to have some kind of measures taken at the border and in the general topic of immigration. Mm. Thank you. Um, I heard uh, in Mexico there was a saying that uh, uh, God cursed Mexico by locating Mexico uh, next to the United States or something like that. And then, so uh, it seems that it reflects the Mexican nationalism uh, that is against the United States. But at the same time, you know, many things are um, driven by um, economic rationality um, based on the economic reality of Mexico integrated into uh, uh, the North American economy and then part of the supply chains uh, of the manufactured products. So um, my question is regarding the tension between the nationalism and economic rationality and how do um, those actors you introduced, like the Mexican uh, consulates transformed into PR agencies and uh, think tanks, how do they handle uh, the tension between nationalism and economic rationality? That's a good one. Well, first of all, we always believe that the Mexicans are very nationalist, and, and yeah, and that we hate the United States. You know, these Americans took our land, Jesus, this was in, in 1848. So, I don't have any clue. And you know, I have clues because I have read about that. But th there's nothing that, that is relevant for me. If you see the, the books that are uh, free, that are the, uh, for primary students, and you read these books in the 1970s, they use the phrase, the United States or American imperialism was doing this. They use the word imperialism. You know how they refer to, refer to the United States today? 
Mexico's economic partner. <laughs> that that's, tells you everything, right? And CIDE, my former institution, um, has conducted a poll since um, ten, 10 years ago, uh, uh, it starts in 2006, about what the Mexicans think about foreign affairs in different areas. And of course, the United States is a big part. Well, the Mexicans are very pro-American. They hate many things about the United States, but they are, in general terms, very pro-American. And 50% of the Mexicans have answered constantly in all those polls that are conducted every two years that they would love to be an American if they can have the economic standards of the Americans. 50% of the Mexicans. So nationalism is <laughs> is good, but I mean, is is not like a, you know I, I will kill myself for Mexico. You know, I always tell my students, what happened if somebody is invading? Imagine, uh, like like in 1812, 1814, the British are here and burning Capitol Hill. What do you do? Do you fight? All of them. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I will go and get the weapon and I kill those. Horrible breed. What do you do? They ask me. I run. I run. Why do I have to defend Mexico? I mean, it, it's and it's a normal thing to 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 think in Mexico. It's not the only one. However, your question is very important. Um, I think that Mexico it's is like one of those lizards that change their color according to the interest. So the example that I gave you before, they were saying, Muera the Heritage Foundation, die the Heritage Foundation in 1986. 1989, they got together with the Heritage Foundation many times to promote the NAFTA agreement. So they change. If they find something that is against, somebody, some institution said, Oh, the Mexicans are crazy. They try to talk to them. It's their business. They talk to them. And they say, look, we are not so bad. Look, for instance, the Mexicans were promoting for, for some time. Do you know that the, you know, the Americans send all these messages from the Department of, of State that it's very dangerous to go to Mexico? Well, the Yucatan Peninsula mm -hmm. is safer than Canada. <laughs> So the Mexicans were saying, look, I mean, everybody said that it's safer than Canada. So they, they accommodate the discourse. They are politicians, and, and some of them, I'm not going to say who are the bads, because I can be punished, but, but some of them are very good. I mean, are very good. So they accommodate their, their interests. They try. When they can't, they basically ignore them. And they make sometimes, <coughs> it's not sometimes, often, to counterattack in an indirect way. So they said, OK, professor, we know that you know a little bit about Asia. Why don't you write a, an op-ed? And I'm going to give you, what, about $3,000. It's saying that the Mexicans could be as successful as China. You know, for $3,000 and a couple hours of work, maybe you do it. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe don't. So they promote this. The think tanks write op-eds all the time. And of course, they play in a very delicate uh, delicate uh, place if, if they get too involved with Mexico or if they support for instance, of NAFTA, there were about 40 scholars, American scholars, very distinguished from people like um, like Jorge Dominguez, that for me is one of the top, top scholars on Latin American politics in this country. I mean, it's an unbelievable uh, brain. They were honestly and independently in favor of NAFTA. But the Mexican government in the Mexican embassy in Washington wrote the letter that they signed. That's cool, right? So they do things in which they try 
to counter attack. They create seminars. Seminars with different viewpoints. They, they, they do that. And there are many people that go in and honestly and independently agree with them. Right? So sometimes it's seducing, sometimes it's people that are in agreement, sometimes it's people that, that criticize, but they have more or less an answer to different uh, situations. And, um, and so economic nationalism is not uh, necessarily the main thing of Mexico. And right now, the way that the, the border, for instance, work in, 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 in the assembly plants is very interesting because before the assembly plants at the border did everything. Right now, they move back and forth all the time, back and forth. So they do one part, they send it to Brazil, they come back here, and they, they put another one, and they did it in Texas, and they, they, you know, it moves back and forth all, all the time. So this has the tools. The, uh, diminish, sorry, the, um, the impact. And finally, we are living in a globalized environment. And the Mexicans, especially the young people, are doing that. They are active. I went to give a lecture in one of the main top universities in Mexico about a month and a half ago, and I asked the guys, how many of you read a foreign press every day in your iPhone or your iPad, like 80 percent. If I ask my students in Texas how many of they do it, three in a class of 40, 45. We are living in a time of the highest connection to the world and the very low connectivity to the world. I mean, you can be connected right now. Huh? I read the newspaper all the time in, of other countries. But most of the people don't use it in Texas for that purpose. So we are isolated in a highly globalized world. Mm -hmm. to say yes, sir. To what degree do you think the uh, uh, drug problem, particularly in the border, along the border, like Juarez or Tijuana and all that, over the years has, has, has prevented uh, a better uh, relationship regarding immigration between our two countries. Oh, drugs is a very serious issue for the United States and for Mexico. And if you see, for instance, the debate right now, many people are saying Donald Trump to go back to the same guy. But others, too, that, that the Mexicans are poisoning the minds and the bodies of the Americans. What we tend to forget is that the United States has the higher levels of consumption of drugs in the world. So, uh, and believe me, if and it's very simple, if you do not like the word the the drugs, you are not going to sell it here. You are. It's like going to Chick Fil A, which, by the way, I like it, uh, <laughs> and, and 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 don't buy the number four. That is what I like. <laughs> because every time that you buy the number four, you get uh, food poison. So, actually, this happened to me in, in, in some brownies in one place, and I don't buy them anymore because I ate them twice. They are delicious, and I get sick. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't buy them. For instance, heroin was not a very important drug 10 years ago in the United States, 50 years ago. The Mexicans start producing heroin, yes. Are the Americans consuming? No. A lot of drugs. A lot of heroin. What happens if they don't consume? So yes, this is a very serious problem, but it's a bilateral problem. It's just a bilateral problem. And this has inhibited other possibilities. The Mexican government has tried to some extent successfully to separate the issues. So one is immigration, one is border, one is drugs, one is security, to try to do it because if not you contaminate the whole situation. And there are many moments in which Mexico and the United States really cooperate. For instance, security at the border. The Mexicans are very good and the Americans are superb. They have all the equipment to, to, to do it and all the intelligence to, to, to follow the trends of this. 
So it's very strong cooperation. And the Americans honestly and independently said, we have a fantastic cooperation with the Mexicans at the border in security terms. So you don't want to contaminate that because of drugs. The Mexicans try to do, but sometimes get contaminated, but they try to separate. So I think that right now, if, to put it in other words, if we do not have a problem of drugs, imagine that disappear, that we do not export drugs and you do not consume drugs, the problem of immigration will still a very important one in the very relation. Mm -hmm. But uh, immigration and all these other issues are very, very important and it's enormously complex. I think yeah. that's one thing that comes out of this is this is too much to cover in one hour and a half session, uh, but again, we are going to be studying these issues in a great deal of depth here at the Tower Center and the Texas-Mexico program, and Professor Velasco is helping us a great deal in organizing it and setting up events just like this. So please join me in thanking him for his presentation. Mm -hmm.